Hello again, poetry people. I have at least one more book tonight. I'm going to do Patricia Lockwood's Motherland, Fatherland, Homeland, Sexuals. I have given a lot of prompts based on this book. This is a fantastic poetry collection. It is most famous for a poem in it called Rape Joke, which is an astounding poem, which I will not be doing. It's long. It's not really mine to read. So you should go to YouTube and check out Patricia Lockwood, Motherland, Fatherland, Homeland Sexuals. You should buy her book. It's on penguin.com. Buy it there. Buy it from your favorite local used bookstore, right? Or not local used, just local bookstore. Used, new, doesn't matter. Support local businesses now. It is really rough for bookstores. Um, so I'm going to read some poems from this excellent book. I uh, hope you enjoy them. Again, the series is kind of like poets that I think should be taught in schools as opposed to starting at the beginning of time and reading Gilgamesh. Come on, man. That's like college after you've run out of all of the interesting stuff. All right. It's the first poem. It's called, Is Your Country a He or a She in Your Mouth? Mine is a man, I think. I love men. They call me a fatherland sexual. All the motherland sexuals have been sailed away, and there were never any here in the first place, they tell us. Myself, I've never seen a mountain. Myself, I've never seen a valley, especially not my own. I am afraid of the people who live there, who eat hawk and wild rice from my pelvic bone. Oh no. I am 14. I have walked into my motherland's bedroom. Her body is indistinguishable from the fatherland who is loving her from behind. So close, their borders match up except for notable arena belonging to the fatherland, I am drawn to the motherland's lurid sunsets. I am reaching my fingers to warm them. The people in my valley are scooping hawk like crazy. I can no longer tell which country is which. Salt air off both their coasts. So gross. Where is a good, nice gulp of Midwestern pre-tornado? The tornado above me has sucked up a cow. The motherland declares the tornado above him has sucked up a bull. She says, pointing to the fatherland. But the cow is clearly a single cow. Chewing a single cut of country. Chewing their countries into one. And I hate this country, I scream. And their eyes shine with rain and fog because at least I'm using the accent of the homeland, at least I'm a homeland sexual, and I would never go away from them. There will one day be two of you too, they say. But I am boarding myself already. I recede from their coasts like a super fairy, packed stem to stern with citizens, all waving hellos and goodbyes, and at night all my people go below and gorge themselves with hunks of hawk, the traditional dish of this new floating heartland. Another of my favorite poems from Motherland, Fatherlands, Homeland Sexuals. This is called, He Married the Stuffed Owl Exhibit at the Indiana Welcome Center. He marries her mites and her wires in her wings. He marries her yellow glass eyes and black centers. He marries her near total head turn. He marries the curve of each of her claws. He marries the information plaque. He marries the extinction of this kind of owl. He marries the owl that she loved in life and the last thought of him in the thick of her mind, just one inch away from the bullet there. He marries the moths who makes holes in the owl, who have eaten the owl almost all away. He marries the branch of the tree that she grips. He marries the real looking moss and dead leaves. He marries the smell of must that surrounds her. He marries the strong blue stares of her children, not her children. He marries the strong blue stares of children. He marries nasty smudges of their noses on the glass. He marries the camera that points at the owl to make sure no one steals her. So the camera won't object when he breaks the glass while reciting some vows that he wrote himself. He screams, owl, instead of aisle, and then always love her, he screams, having to hold and takes hold of the owl and wrenches the owl away from her branch and he covers her in kisses and the owl thinks, 
more moths. And at that final hungry kiss, that must have been the last big bite. There is no more of me left to eat, and thank God. When he marries the stuffing out of the owl, and hoots as the owl flies out under his arm, they elope into the darkness of Indiana. Indiana, he screams, is their new life, and welcome! They live in a tree together now, and the children of welcomed Indiana say, who even more than usual? And the children of Indiana say, who even more than usual? And the children of Welcome Indiana, Welcome to Indiana, they wonder where they belong. Not in Indiana, they say to themselves. The state of all consuming love. We cannot belong in Indiana. As night falls and the moths appear, one by one, hungry. The Arch. Living mon the arch of all living monuments has the fewest facts attached to it. They slide right off its surface. No Lincoln lap for them to sit on and no horse to be astride. Here's what I know for sure. It was a gift from one city to another. A city cannot travel to another city. A city cannot visit any city but itself, and in its sadness, it gives away a great door in the air. Well, a city cannot, except for Paris, who puts on a hat styled with pigeon wings and walks through the streets of another city and will not even see the sights, too full she is of the sights already. And within her walk, her women and the women of Paris just looking, they just walked through an arch. Or, or am I mixing it up? I think I am. With another famous female statue? Uh, born in its shadow and shook foil, hot the facts slid off me also. I and the arch, we burned to the touch. Don't touch that arch. A boy we know got third degree burns from touching that arch, says my mother, sitting for her statue. She is metal on a hilltop, and so sad she's not a cross. She was long ago given to us by Ireland. What an underhand gift for an elsewhere to give. A door that reminds you you can leave it? She raises her arm to brush my hair. Oh, no female armpit lovelier than the armpit of the arch. When the world was ten years old, he fell deep in love with Egypt. Just as he fell in love with the dinosaurs. Just as he would fall in love with the moon. No women in the world yet. He was only ten years old. Ten-year-old is made of time, and the world has forever to learn about Egypt. He entered encyclopedias and looted every fact of them, and when he had finished looting there, he broke into the Bible. He snuck into his mother's room and drew thick lines around eyes, that, and those were the borders of Egypt. He carefully wrote in stiff, small birds. He carefully wrote in coiled snakes. He carefully wrote in flat-footed humans. The ten-year-old world needed so much privacy, he learned to draw the door bolt glyph and learn to make the sound it made. I'm an old white British man, decided the ten-year-old world. I wear a round lens on my right eye, the day, and see only a blur with my left eye, the night. When the sun shone on him, it shone on Egypt. All the dark for a while was the dark in the pyramids. The left lung of his body was the shape of Africa, and one single square breath in it, Egypt. They never found all the tombs. He knew. Anyone might be buried in Egypt, thought the ten-year-old world, in love with it. I will send my wind down into my valley, and my wind will uncover the doors to the tombs, and I will go down myself inside them, and shine light on all the faces, and light on the moons full of gold, and light on even the littlest pets, on the mice and the beetles of the ten-year-old kings, and shine light on even their littlest names. This is called The Fake Tears of Shirley Temple. How many sets of her parents are dead? How many times over is she an orphan, a plane, a crosswalk, a boar war, a childbirth, of course, her childbirth, when she, Shirley Temple, came out of her mother, plump even at her corners like a 
bag of goldfish, and one pin pinhole, just one pinhole necessary, Shirley Temple cry for us. And Shirley Temple cried. The first word of no baby is, hello. How strange. The baby believes, I was here before you, learning to wave just like the Atlantic. Alone in the world, just like the Atlantic, and left on a doorstep just like the Atlantic, wrapped in the grayest, roughest blanket, Shirley Temple gurgled, and her first words were, your father is lost at sea. Your mother was thrown by a foam-colored horse. Your father's round face is a round set of ripples. Every gull has a chunk of beak. Shirley Temple, what makes you cry? What do you think of to make you cry? Mommy stand in a circle and whisper to her, Shirley Temple, there will be war. Shirley Temple, you'll get no lunch. Dry and dry, a perfect desert. Then, Shirley Temple, your goldfish are dead. They're swimming towards the ocean even now. And her tears fall in black and white, and her tears, they star in the movie. She cries so wet, her hair uncurls, and then the rag is in the ringlet, and the curl is in the wave. She thinks of dimples tearing out of her cheeks and just running out of cheeks, knees, and elbows, and running hard back to the little creamy waves where they belong, and the ocean, her first glimpse of the ocean, was a fake tear for Dad. A completely filled eye for her unseen dead father, who, when he isn't dead, he is gone across the water. Factories are everywhere in poetry right now. <clears throat> We're watching a crayon being made. We're children. We're watching the crayon become crayons and more crayons and thinking how can there be enough room in America to make what makes it up. We're thinking all America is a factory by now. The head of it churning out fake oranges. The hand of it churning out glass bottles. The heel of it churning out Lego men. We're watching lifelike snakes get made. We're watching lifelike rats get made. We're watching army men get made. A whole factory for magic wands. A whole factory for endless scarves. A whole factory, America, for the making of doves. A whole factory, America, for the making of long-eared rabbits and their love of deep, dark holes. We are watching a marble being made. How does the cat's eye get in the marble? And how does the sight get into that? How does the hand get on it? How does the hand attach to the child? How does the child attach to the dirt? And how does the dirt attach to its only name, America? The name is manufactured here by rows of me in airless rooms. Sunlight is accidental. Sunlight is run off from the light bulb factory, is oozed on the surface of all our rivers. Our abandoned factories make empty space, and our largest factory produces distance and its endless conveyor produces miles and people in the basement produce our underground hillbilly teeth are made here but hillbilly teeth are made everywhere maybe the factory that makes us is overseas and meanwhile we america churn out china france russia spain and our glimpses of them from across the ocean above the factory billowing clouds can be seen for miles around Long lines of us never glances up from the long line of glimpses we're making. We could make those glimpses in the dark. Our fingerprints could see to do it. All the flashing fish in the Finger Lakes have extra plus eyes in America. The last factory, which makes last lines, makes zippers for sudden reveals. A break in the tree opens zip on a view. The last line opens zip on enormous meaning. Why haven't you written? The past, when it was sick right down to its roses, obsessively checked the mail. We wore all of our pathways checking the mail. We went into the woods because we heard the letters rustling, and we swore they sounded like letters to us. Even Thoreau on Walden Pond checked his open mouth every morning, foolishly believing it to be the mail. We worshipped a great white body that was an avalanche of good news, and we slid it open in every part. That can't go through the mail, the postman gasped, because that is a super-stabbed body. The super-stabbed body rose up 
with many butter knives sticking out of it and said, I am the male. It had so many lovers. Everyone alive had a finger in it, ripping it open, sometimes with blood, deep bleeding wounds of information all over the back and forth form. It took a long time to be delivered then and traveled in sacks like shapes of women and women were full of sharp secret corners where their postcards were poking out. And at last in their bedrooms, they sighed with relief as they shook out their sacks with both hands and faithfully and affectionately and yours tumbled out and even I am tumbled out. Most letters were love letters until they were not. That was when the mail began to change and enveloped. The only word that was believed to contain its meaning was opened and found to be empty. Back then, it meant something when my letter never arrived. And now, after 10 years reaches you who are dead or in love with a lookalike or so full of hate for me that you can barely see to read this. If you're not reading this, then it never got there and both of us are married to someone else. The body of the male still waits for your knife. Why haven't you written? Why don't you write? Final poem, again, Patricia Lockwood's Motherland, Fatherland, Homewood Sexuals. Motherland, Fatherland, Homeland Sexuals is the name of the book. Penguin.com. Excellent book. You should buy it. The last poem I'm going to read is called There Were No There Were No New Colors for Years. Before neon came along, was made, did not grow like the rest of the colors or grew as a tumorous growth on art. Wherever sun touched it too much, and we went to see that tumor in the museum, whenever our parents would take us and brought replicas home from the gift shop, before neon there wasn't a way to buy plastic packs of plastic stars and put the Big Dipper on your ceiling. No way to put stars on your ceiling at all unless you went outside and slept there. Which we stopped doing years before when all adults woke up and wanted to touch a firm camper between the legs. It was a new kind of fruit, like the maraschino, and they craved it every minute of the day. So, we stayed indoors and reflected the glow and all adults were jealous they turned old-timey shades of green and they hated our head to tone neon because the names were just the same but with neon before them like colors woke freshly divorced and demanded that people call them ms this made parents uncomfortable and sexually helpless they pictured nipples like eyes on stocks they thought why was I born too late? And thought how much scarier it would be when Orson Welles lied about the aliens if they'd been able to see neon in their minds back then. And they banged the doors angry on their sleeping children, no doubt dreaming neon dreams that would have killed the parents with how scary they were. So hard, the biggest stars fell down and fell into our mouths and we woke in the morning tasting them. And the stars tasted toxic and perfectly new.